the murder trial of Derek Chauvin has wrapped up for the week. The former Minneapolis police officer is charged in the death of George Floyd. Today, we heard from Minneapolis Police Sergeant John Edwards. He described securing the scene of Floyd's deadly arrest and telling two officers to, quote, chill out because he knew that escort sergeants were coming to transfer them to be interviewed about what happened. Lieutenant Rick Zimmerman testified next. He works with the Minneapolis Police Department's homicide unit. He was questioned by the prosecution about policies on use of force. Have you ever, in all the years you've been working for the Minneapolis Police Department, uh, been trained to kneel on the neck of someone who is handcuffed behind their back in a prone position? No, I haven't. Is that, if that were done, would that be considered force? Absolutely. What level of force might that be? That would be the top tier, the deadly force. Why? Because of uh, the fact that um, if, if your knee is on a person's neck, that can kill them. For more on this, I want to bring in uh, Judith Brown Diana. She's a lawyer and the executive director of the Advancement Project National Office. Judith, thank you so much for joining us. Um, so there's been a lot of testimony to sift through over this week. It's been a, a jam-packed week of really emotionally charged testimony. What are your takeaways from the trial so far? So it's been a hard week. I have uh, tuned in every day, and my takeaways are that it was a traumatic event for everybody to witness that all of the witnesses were pleading for Officer Chauvin to stop, um, that George Floyd was pleading for his life, but that Derek Chauvin just kept at it and decided that he wanted to end George Floyd's life and that he didn't care. And I think the big takeaway for us is, you know, is, is that this really shows the dehumanization of black people at the hands of police. And that this isn't just about this trial, but it is kind of the, the story that black, the black community keeps telling America, that there is a problem with policing and that we are targeted by the police. And we saw a lot of emotional testimony and video this week. How do you think the defense will try to counter that? Well, it's interesting. Actually, uh, you know, one of the things that I thought they would say is that he was trained to do this. But in fact, his superiors said that he used excessive use of force, that there was a point at which he should have stopped. Um, so that defense seems to be out the window. So I think what they're going to turn to is trying to assassinate the uh, character of George Floyd and to talk about his drug addiction problems and that um, they'll bring in probably toxicology reports and put on experts that will say that it wasn't because of the knee on the neck, but in fact, that there were drugs in his system and that he had heart disease. But at the end of the day, Everybody sees it. Um, he was fine. He, you know, he, before the encounter with the police, he was fine. And on the other end of that, he was dead. Yeah, when you watch those videos, it really does just seem like hours, you know, that you're, that you're watching this, this all unfold. Um, we saw a retired, speaking on, on use of force, we saw a retired police sergeant comment on use of force in what sounded like expert testimony, despite not being qualified as an expert. The defense could file for a mistrial because of this. Would that have been an unusual move? Well, I, you know, I think what, what is going to happen is that we're going to see lots of moves on behalf of the defendant because they're, they should be desperate right about now. Um, and I think what happened was that this lieutenant, and we also had the sergeant who basically talked about their training and that they're the people who supervise. And this is the thing that's important. It's that we have to know that at what point does it become murder? And so to them, they understand how he was trained. They know. And so, yes, um, the defense is going to file all kinds of, uh, of motions to get out of this case because they know they have a sinking ship and that people who are watching and the jury probably believe that this is murder. We saw that this series of events that unfolded reignited you know, movements across the entire country, protests throughout the entire last summer. Um, what impacts do you think that this trial could have on our society as a whole going forward? 
You know, this this trial is very important. Um, we know that we've seen police officers walk away from killing black people, even when there were videos in the past. But I think important in this case is, first of all, accountability in this particular case. But really, accountability and justice are two things, because justice would require a transformation of the way that we do policing in this country and public safety. And so what we should be taking away from this is the way in which the police interaction with black people escalates from the moment of a, of a small thing that was a fake $20 bill to an officer pulling, putting a gun to his head while he's sitting in the car, to handcuffing him, to, to actually pulling him into a car, then pulling him out of a car, all of the kind of excessive use of force, and police officers knowing there's no pulse. And a police officer who has his sunglasses on his head and doesn't care and just keeps his knee on a black man's neck. And so I hope that what we will take away from this is that we have to have sweeping changes with regard to policing and the criminal legal system to stop over-criminalizing people and to make sure that police are held accountable and that we understand that public safety has to come in a very different way. Because those young people who were on the stands, teenagers and a 10-year-old, know that they don't feel safe around the police. And that is a huge problem in our society. There are some large and difficult conversations, many of them, ahead. Judith Brown, Dianis, thank you so much for your insight. Thank you.